Good evening, I'm Carolyn Stokes. And I'm Peter Cowan. Here's what else is making news right now. Appealing the verdict, the Crown says the judge made mistakes in the sexual assault trial of RNC Constable Doug Snellgrove. A plea for Retea, the mother of the Nova Scotia girl who was sexually assaulted and cyberbullied, speaks to teens in Cornerbrook. Well, we have mixed precipitation already affecting portions of the island, and that will continue tonight, so freezing rain warnings are in place. Also, some snowfall warnings to tell you about into Labrador. That's all coming up. We start with news from the courts. The Crown is appealing the acquittal of RNC Constable Doug Snellgrove. Late last month, a jury found Snellgrove not guilty of sexual assault. And here and now's Glenn Payette covered that seven day trial and joins us now with more on this appeal. Glenn? Well, to put it simply, the Crown says that Justice Valerie Marshall got a few things wrong, including that she failed to properly instruct the jury on the meaning of consent and that she failed to instruct them on a particular section of the criminal code. Now, the Crown uh, asked Marshall to tell the jury there could be no consent where the accused induces the complainant to engage in the sexual activity by abusing a position of trust, power, or authority. Well, Marshall ruled that there was no inducement uh, by Snellgrove, so she wouldn't give the jury that instruction. Now, I asked the Crown today for an interview. They wouldn't do one. I was hoping to get uh, further uh, clarity on just what the grounds for the uh, appeal is. You must remember that Snellgrove was not uh, charged with a breach of trust. Well, the complainant said she can't remember very much of what happened. At trial, there was no mention of Snellgrove inducing her to have sex. Well, there has been quite a hue and outcry since Snowgrove was found not guilty, so word of the appeal will be applauded in many quarters. Now, don't expect the appeal to be in court anytime soon. It will take months for the Crown and defense to file the necessary uh, paperwork, and then a hearing date will have to be set. So the appeal could be heard later this year and maybe sometime next year. Reporting live from St. John's, I'm Glenn Payette for Here and Now. Well, in about half an hour, we'll take a closer look at the court definition of consent through the eyes of an expert on human rights laws. Well, to Cornerbrook now, where the mother of Retea Parsons is sharing her daughter's horrific story of cyberbullying and suicide to students. Leah Parsons' daughter took her own life in 2013 after a vulgar picture of her drunk at a party circulated amongst her peer group in Dartmouth. Now, the Nova Scotia woman talks to children Retea's age about consent and cyber attacks. And a warning, there are graphic details in this report. Here and now, Colleen Connors attended today's event and joins us now live. Colleen? Well, Carolyn, you have to picture this. It's an auditorium filled with grade nine students. It's the last period of the day, but you could hear a pin drop. This story of Retea really resonated with these students who were very close to her age as her mother Leah spoke to them all about her. So her mother Leah used a PowerPoint presentation showing pictures of Retea and video clips from all the news this story generated. And she says that when her daughter was 17, she got drunk on vodka at a party and four males raped her when she was at that party. Now someone took a photo of her being assaulted while getting sick out a window. And that picture started to circulate all around Retea's school. And Parson says what happened to Retea was more than bullying. It was an attack. And she feels that her daughter was targeted. Now, 17 months after that party, Retea took her own life. And now her mother speaks all across Canada to youth like you see here. And she's hoping to make some change in how these photos and these stories and how people share things online. Those are the issues, sexualized violence, cyber abuse, uh, youth mental health, those are the issues that are very important and it's really important to get a message out there to them so that we can make changes in what's going on all over the world and Retea never wanted to be silenced so I'm now her voice, it's her message, I'm her voice and it's important to honour her life and to make changes for youth and Retea has two little sisters so I want to make change for them as well. 
So while those youth, those grade nine students were watching Leah's presentation, I was watching the students and they were so quiet. They were watching in pure shock, really, with their jaws dropped at what they were hearing about this graphic story of someone very close to their age. I spoke with one grade nine year old girl who says that she didn't know of Retea, but after hearing this story, she says that she will be taking extra steps to be very careful about what she posts online. It was really uh, touching to hear her story and all about it. We hear stuff like this all the time and we got to really take it to heart. Um, it's really saddening to see stories like this. Now, Leah Parsons says that when that awful photo of her daughter started circulating around her school, Retea's friends didn't support Retea, but many of them went against her, went behind her back and, and didn't support her during that time. And what Leah hopes by speaking out in public, she hopes that women and young girls support one another in times like this. Now, Leah is speaking at a International Women's Day event this evening. Live in Cornerbrook, I'm Colleen Connors for Here and Now. We bring you now to more on the dilemma in Labrador involving the large number of Indigenous children going into foster care. As we've reported, Labrador has just 6% of the population, but more than 30% of the children in care. And about 80 of those children are in care in communities outside of Labrador, like in Roddickton. Well, we've heard from the leaders in Labrador, we've heard from parents who've lost their children and from foster parents who've opened their homes. And tonight we sit down with the Premier, Dwight Ball, to get some answers. He's also the Minister of Labrador and Indigenous Affairs. Terry Roberts has been doing a lot of work on this story and he joins us now live. So Terry, what's the Premier saying about this issue? Yeah, Peter, well, he makes it clear. He's very concerned and he's not entirely satisfied with what's being done. Now, he says the province wants to do more and he said several times during our conversation that the federal government also needs to be more involved. But it was clear there's no great master plan in the works to reduce the number of children going into care from being uprooted from their communities, their culture. When the decision is made to remove a child, uh, a priority is always to look for family members who, are, who can actually give that uh, foster care to those children. If that's not an option, then you look for extended family members that are, would be available. And as a last resort, the last option would be to put them in the family placement uh, with outside their community. Now, this is the response we've been hearing all along from government. In fairness, uh, this issue is challenging governments and Indigenous leaders across the country. The other noteworthy point from the Premier is that places like Roddickton could see even more children from Labrador. There's a shortage of foster homes in Labrador, and the Premier said the safety of children is the top priority, superseding any cultural or community connections. And we realize that the cultural activities are compromised once you go outside Aboriginal communities. There's no doubt about that. We recognize that. But they are in a safe environment. And so then what we have to do is make sure the opportunities are there to provide those cultural activities, making sure the visitation is on a regular basis with their families. Their families can come into those areas. Not ideal. We will never give up on making sure that we can put the right environment for those children. Now there is so, uh, you know, some hope that change could be coming. There's a review underway of the Child Protection Act and the Premier told me there's a first of its kind round table planned for this spring to discuss Indigenous issues. And he said the issue of foster children will be very high on the agenda. Carolyn. Thank you, Terry. Well, civilian employees at Five Wing Goose Bay are voicing their anger at their employer, Serco. The employees say working conditions have deteriorated since last year's layoffs. They held a demonstration today, and here and now's Jacob Barker was there. Here at the gate to Five Wing Goose Bay, workers want their voices heard, not just by Serco, but by the federal government who signed a contract with the company last year. Their wages were cut, some as much as $20 an hour, others lost their jobs. There was no reason for my job to be gone. The work was there every day. I, I had work. I was a busy guy, like you know what I mean. And we will do everything we possibly can. National union reps were in town today to help drive the point home. They say even though the new $115 million contract is worth about $15 million more than the previous one, there were no new jobs or benefits 
only cutbacks. We don't see any savings at all, and in fact, it's more expensive to the company for doing it. The union says grievances are up about 90% since the cuts. Janitors are being asked to do more on the base, and other employees are being forced to take shifts that take them away from their families and volunteer work. This is not fair to them. This is not what they signed up for. They've been working on this base for 15 years, and now all of a sudden you're telling them that they're going to change their hours of work. The union says they believe there's an open line of communication with the company, but they're just not being listened to. I don't want to be here. I don't like doing this. Again, the circle managers, I do believe, I like to believe, are good people. It's just that they're not making good decisions. The union, which can't strike because of the terms of the collective agreement, says that demonstrations like this one will continue if no changes are made. Circo said today that though the actions that it took have been difficult, they're necessary if they're going to fulfill their agreements with the Department of National Defense. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. Well, this is the week deep cuts in the workforce take effect at the Come By Chance oil refinery. But CBC News has learned those job losses might not be quite as extensive as originally planned. Last fall, the company announced it had to slash 128 jobs to stay competitive. But a source says the company has backed off on a plan to close the on-site lab, which means 12 jobs have been protected. Another 12 workers have accepted retirement packages, so more than 80 unionized employees will be without a job as of Friday. The union is planning a rally outside the refinery on Saturday to raise concerns about safety and environmental risks. The company has not responded to requests for comment. Well, Nalcor says so far it's only been able to account for an additional $3 million in costs because of these protests last fall. Through an access to information request, Here and Now has learned that the cost was for extra security, travel, and salaries during the 11-day shutdown of the site. Employees on the site were out more money than the company, actually. They lost out on $15 million in wages after the site was shut down and they were temporarily laid off. The bill so far is a lot smaller than the $200 million the CEO estimated the protests were costing. But Nalcor says the actual amount will be much higher once contractors put in their claims and the costs of delays are accounted for. Well, remember this dash cam video? Yeah, right there. A truck illegally passing a string of vehicles on the Peacekeepers Highway in Conception Bay South. Well, today the man driving that truck pleaded guilty to dangerous driving. Roger Hendry of CBS was charged last November. He will be back in court in May for sentencing. Well, people in Black Tickle on the coast of Labrador had a few visitors after digging out from a four-day snowstorm. As many as seven polar bears were spotted in or around the community on Tuesday. And that caused a lot of excitement for visitors, such as singer-songwriter Sherman Downey, who's in town and who snapped these pics. Well, could Gander soon roll out the red carpet for a movie theater? Council recently tabled a study that looked into whether it would be financially viable. Here and now's Chris Ensing has the details. Last April, the town of Gander started a feasibility study. They set aside $16,000, paying for part of the study, to see if a movie theater should come back to Gander. There used to be one here at the Fraser Mall, but it closed down, and council says it's left a gaping hole in the community. Right now, the best way to watch a film is to sit down and hope that the trailer comes on TV and that it's, well, interesting enough to tide you over till the movie comes out on Netflix. You can also go to a charity event at the Arts and Culture Center. Sometimes organizations host those as a way to raise funds. Now, the town of Gander has a recreation plan, and in that plan, the public said the most wanted building was actually a movie theater. So they did this feasibility study, and here are the results. It suggested that it is feasible. Uh, we went out and the catchment area is about 65,000 people. So we looked at uh, within a 100 kilometer radius. And uh, it is feasible to do, but it has to uh, take a large capital cost up front, obviously. And once the capital is done and the thing is actually built, then there's enough people here to sustain it. So that's what we're trying to convince uh, you know, players that they can, they can build it and they will come. 
Now you heard her talk about capital costs. It's expected to be in excess of $5 million to get a movie theater here in Gander. Now, council isn't going to suggest taxpayers pay for that and there's a town council presented movie theater. They want a private business to run and operate this. So what's happened is they've showed the feasibility study to some people who have expressed interest in the past of bringing a movie theater here. Now, I also spoke with a man who owns and operates one in Grand Falls, Windsor. He said that he's looked at coming to Gander before and opening up a movie theater here and said he wants to see the feasibility study to see if the financial numbers make sense. So for now, we're stuck with our streaming services, but it seems like there could be something on the horizon. Chris Hensing, CBC News, Gander. <laughs> well, uh, sticking with the big screen, we have a little bit of back padding to do. Yeah, we want to take you to Toronto now where the Canadian Screen Awards were handed out last night. Have a look. When it comes to sharing the broadcast news, it's all about the connection and the trust. It's more than personality, it's the faith the viewer has in the people on the screen. A great local newscast is the lifeblood of a community. These are the teams that had a meaningful impact locally on their audience. Best Local Newscast. The nominees are CBC News, Here and Now, CBC Toronto News, CTV News Toronto at 6, Global News Hour at 6. I'm, I'm shaking. <laughs> you can do yeah, this. I'm, you can do this. And the CSA goes to CBC News, Here and Now. <laughs> Lee Pitts, Jen White, Debbie Cooper, Jonathan Crow, Brian Snowden, and Rod Dobbin. Wow, <laughs> this is such an honor. I appreciate this so much. Um, we have a storied tradition of our program in the province. I like to think we've gained the trust of our audience and, and this validates what we do every day. I wanna thank all the people behind the scenes. We couldn't do this show without our producers, editors, reporters, and uh, Ryan, you must say something. New addition, eight years to the show. I've been there for 30. <laughs> He's the new kid on the block. Thanks to the uh, Newfoundland and Labrador weather for delivering over and over and over and over again. Thank you, congratulations to everybody. Oh. So nice. <laughs> and as uh, Debbie said, of course, television is a team game and there are a lot of people who make here and now happen. Uh, people that help us bring stories that we hope resonate and make a difference in your lives. And thank you, of course, uh, as well to uh, for spending your time with us. Absolutely. Well, we wouldn't do this if you guys weren't watching there. So and I'm kind of embarrassed to say that we actually have a few more awards to talk about. It's, <laughs> I guess it's awards season here. The nominations are in for the RTDNA Awards for Atlantic Canada. And here now is up for two more awards. Best Newscast as well as spe Best Spot News for our coverage of the Beta Verde fish plant fire. Yes, and CBC NL is also up for live special event coverage for the 100th anniversary of Beaumont Hamill special and CBC Radio is up for a long feature award for a documentary on World War One. The Team Gushu game has gone to extra ends and things are tense here at mile one. Don't go anywhere. Another update from the Briar right after the break.
Welcome back to Here and Now. This is another big day for Brad Guju and his rink at the Briar at mile one. And it's pretty tense down there. They're in an extra end against BC. It's all tied up. And Zach Gowdy is there live. So, Zach, what's the situation looking like right now? Uh, they're making us sweat, Peter. Brad Gushu just throwing his second uh, to last stone in this 11th end, an extra end. Uh, from the looks of things right now, Brad Gushu could be in pretty good shape. He has the hammer. Right now, he would be facing an open draw to the button. And if you speak curling ease, uh, that should translate into a fairly comfortable situation. But hey, it's the 11th end. It's an extra end. Nobody out there is uh, comfortable right now. This game's so important, as are all the games now, as we move into the, uh, the tail end of the round robin play. Starting on Friday night, there will be only four teams out of this field of 12 that make it to the playoffs. If Team Gushu can win this game, they're their grip on a playoff position will get a lot tighter. If they should lose, then they will be in a dogfight with three or four other teams for that final playoff position. So, yeah, pretty tense here at mile one. So, Zach, that's the action that's happening on the ice. But as we've seen this week, there's been a lot of colorful characters off the ice. And you've been meeting a lot of them. So tell me about that. Indeed. Well, uh, Peter, you know, the, the big stars on the ice have been making some amazing shots, but you can't make a great shot without great ice to play on, and that is the domain of one man, Jamie Borassa. His name in curling circles is almost as famous as names like Brad Gushu or Kevin Cooey, and uh, he has had an extra challenge this week. Not only is he minding four ice surfaces for three games a day, he's doing it all on one leg. Have a look. My name is Jamie Barassa and I'm the head ice technician for the Briar this week. Yeah, you're something of the man when it comes to ice technicians and curling. Well, uh, some days I guess maybe. <laughs> this summer I was in China and uh, uh, across Canada twice now already, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's been a busy year already. <laughs> uh, I couldn't help but notice that you're not moving perhaps as fast as you might have liked. Yeah, well, sometimes people slip on things and <laughs> break things, so. Yeah, I just slipped on some ice outside uh, back home and it's getting better. Another couple of weeks in the cast and it'll be fine. It wasn't in the service of your duty. You didn't slip on a no, curling ring. No, thank God. That would even be worse if I ended up slipping at work. So, no, it's all good. Well, what goes into making a good curling ice surface? There's a few things, and I guess to give you the Reader's Digest version, is we just we have to control our environment first, um, and that comes with having a good building and being able to control what we have, and uh, then we have to control the ice surface itself, so temperature and how we prepare it and our pebble water and all that. You mentioned the, the pebbling. Tell us about how that factors into the game. Well, it, what the pebbling is, is actually uh, creates little bumps on the ice for the rocks to run on. Uh, if they were flat on the ice, they wouldn't be able to they'd just slide right into the wall. They have to be able to, to glide down the ice. So Now, this isn't the ice that people are used to skating on down here at Mile 1, or I should say is being augmented by you guys. No, but it's it's close by. It's just underneath our ice. We oh. actually build on top of it, so, so it's all still there for you. <laughs> Just before I let you go, you've seen countless briars. How does the one in St. John's compare so far? Oh, it's fantastic. I, I, the crowd's absolutely wonderful. It's it's great to sit here, and, and the players are making lots of good shots. So, yeah, it's exciting. Well, can you tell from the sound of the crowd what just happened? Brad Gushu made that crucial open draw to the button. He scores one in the 11th end to win this game against British Columbia. Again, an absolutely crucial match in terms of the playoff picture for this weekend. That really puts Team Gushu in a much more comfortable spot than they were when this game began. Not much time to celebrate, though. They are back on the ice this evening at 8 o'clock against another of their big playoff contenders, the team from Quebec. Reporting live from the Briar, I'm Zach Gowdy for Here and Now. Woo! <laughs> Perfect timing. Congratulations to Team Guju. We have our fingers crossed for the next one. Well, we have uh, another little curling lesson uh, tonight. Olympic gold medalist Jamie Korab explains what all the yelling is about in curling. And he explains some of that uh, curling ease. I think that's how uh, Zach put it. Like, what is a hog line anyway? But 
yeah, there's typically a lot of yelling and curling. You know, you'll get a skip that'll say, hard, hurry, hard. That means he wants you to sweep. Hurry, hard, come on. Hard, don't touch the rock. And you'll see body language and skips like leaning back if it needs to curl or not curl. And then there's right off, whoa, don't touch it. That means don't sweep it, don't even look at it, don't even think about it. You'll hear skips say lots of different stuff sometimes. Can you explain all the bits and bobs uh, here? Yeah, we do have some funky terms in curling. It is a game that was invented in Scotland 500 odd years or 600 years ago. So this right here is what we got, it's called the hack. And if you are a right-handed thrower, you have to go from this end. So your right foot will go in there. If you're a lefty, you go from this end. Okay. And then we've got the back line. So this is the back of the house here. So rocks, once they're completely past this line, they're out of play and you take them out. And this is the button. So this is what you're trying to get closest to, but obviously there's strategy involved. So you don't just throw all your rocks closest to the middle and hope for the best. So this is what they actually call the free guard zone. So this is something that a lot of questions people have. This rule was brought in about 17 years ago. The first three rocks of the end, that's from outside the house mm -hmm. to this line up here, which we'll get to in a second, it's called the free guard zone. So you're not allowed to remove any rocks from this area. Now, if it's your own rock, you can remove it. And the last one here is the hog line. <laughs> Basically, your rock has to get completely over this line to be in play. And, what, and if it doesn't, then it's just not in if play. If it doesn't, it comes out. When usually at club curling, if you hog a rock, you've got to buy a round for your team. Well, it was actually like a beautiful sunny day in St. John's oh, today. Oh yeah, perfect wintry, almost spring conditions, but Unfortunately, it's not just going to be ice on the rink. It looks like there's some ice coming from much mm -hmm. of the province. Let's check in with Colette Kennedy, who's here now with the forecast. Well, we certainly have lots of active weather on the way. In fact, uh, already seeing some of that mixed precipitation, a little bit of freezing rain mixed in that's affecting southwestern portions of the island. And, you know, not only that, but we're going to be looking at this, some of it lingering into tomorrow. The bulk of it in the overnight hours, which is kind of a good thing, but uh, we have to kind of break down Thursday for you as well. Now, the highs today, having a look at these, obviously some of these numbers above freezing and some mild numbers, Terra Nova up to 5 degrees and then the cooler readings up into Labrador. Well, temperatures really play a part, and so do the winds as the system moves in. So as we get the warm front riding in, you get some of that colder air spilling over top of warmer air at the surface, and that's when we tend to get into the freezing rain and issues with freezing rain. So I do want you to know that there's a special weather statement for many parts of the island and into Labrador, but more importantly are the warnings. So these are the freezing rain warnings. You see the areas here all in this kind of pink pinky purple and that's including of course St. John's goes through the Avalon up towards the northern peninsula there towards St. Anthony and then we also have to be concerned about these snowfall warnings and seeing this along the coast and then stretching in towards Happy Valley Goose Bay through here where all told 15 to 25 centimeters of snowfall possible. Now I know towards Labrador City already been seeing that snow moving in. So getting into the snowfall accumulations, I'll kind of show you uh, the totals, but also what's to come from what you've already received. So taking you towards the future trackers, we look into the evening hours. Once those temperatures rise above the freezing mark, then that's when we see this mostly turning over to a rainfall event. But as this rides in, see how it really looks like on this particular model, just a slim band of freezing rain pushing very rapidly across the Avalon. I don't want you to get too caught up on what the model is seeing because we're going to have some differences, especially because of the topography and how we're going to see some of the colder pockets in here and what's going to happen. So really there is a risk of seeing some ice pellets in here, freezing rain, turning over to rain though as the winds change direction and we get that warm up, snow on the backside, a little area of freezing rain or mixed snow rain ice pellets here in the middle middle between these two areas of rain and snow, but that expands a little bit through the overnight hours. Did you see that? And there again, so there's going to be times where you're going to get more into the ice pellets and then it comes back into more of a rainfall event, snow on the back end continuing. That's why yesterday I was saying for Happy Valley Goose Bay, some of those totals might increase. And then getting into a clearing trend after we get rid of some of the fog, some of the drizzle and rain showers in the early morning hours, clearing and then 
again, with that northwesterly flow, we'll start to see some flurries or at least some drizzle later in the day coming back. So it's going to be sort of a mix of everything into tomorrow, including in the middle, probably a nice portion of the day. Much of it coming in the overnight hours, especially that risk for seeing the freezing rain there, St. Anthony, Gander, St. John's, but mixed precipitation elsewhere with those temperatures, in many cases rising through the night. So minus three coming up towards two tomorrow morning and then four for the high St. John's. Again, starting off not this pleasant, and then getting into some breaks into the afternoon, and then probably we get this flurry activity coming back in, or in some cases some light showers where the temperature will be above freezing. So uh, quite a mix we're going to be seeing. I'll show you those snowfall accumulations when I come back, and we'll go in a little bit of in-depth into the long range as well. We're back in the basement of the Royal Ontario Museum talking about the blue whales. Now coming up, I'm going to give you a tour with the guy who flensed it, Mark Engstrom. Today, members of the media and special guests got a front row seat for the Royal Ontario Museum's new blue whale exhibit. The display features a blue whale that washed ashore in western Newfoundland back in 2014. Now, after nearly three years of work, the public will soon get to see it. The CBC's Jeremy Eaton is live at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto tonight. Jeremy? 
I'm not sure who's better dressed, the blue whale or me. Uh, either way, we got uh, the public got a chance, certain members of the public got a chance to see this blue whale for the first time, and it did not disappoint. But I want to show our viewers at home exactly what it looked like. So here's a little walk and talk that I did with the guy who helped flens it, Mark Engstrom. So can we talk a little bit about, so which part are we looking at here? Oh, so we're look, well, we're looking here at the tail. And I think one of the things you can see really easily is here is how we've mounted it. Uh, so the whale is a research specimen and we don't want to do any damage to it. So rather than drilling a hole through the vertebrae and stringing it along, you can see that it's mounted and there, there, there are all these placeholders that hold it like jewel mounts, each bone individually. So we can easily take them out, study them, or put it, and put them back in. So as we move along down, I guess we get into the vertebrae. That's okay. right, so you're going, you're, you're going down from the, from the caudal vertebrae uh, to the sacral vertebrae, and that's marked by these pelvic bones. Okay. So this is actually the rem, these tiny little bones are the remnants of the pelvis. Uh, in a whale. So as you know, the whales have mostly lost their hind limbs. And the only, the only vestige that's left are these little tiny little bones which are not connected to the skeleton. Do you remember sitting on the slipway there in Woody Point uh, cutting out these vertebrae? Oh, I one? do, I do. One by one, from back to front, we were taking, we took this animal apart. Matter of fact, I kind of lost track a little bit in my head how big it was. Because <laughs> you're dismembering it bone by bone. Uh, and I, and I saw, and then you see all the bones in a pile. And I got worried when I've been telling everybody how big it is, and I got worried that when we actually put it up, it wouldn't seem so big. But it actually seems fairly big to me. <laughs> <laughs> so then we move down and we get uh, towards the rib section, and uh, I guess a lot of t at the time a lot of people talked about the smell of the yeah, whale. Do you, yeah, do you remember yeah. when you started to cut out the guts here? Uh, yeah, no, no. Was, yeah, as you went back to the, uh, short towards the front, then you started getting to the internal organs and so on. And of course, the smell is horrendous. <laughs> You remember, there's not much, not much that smells worse than a dead whale. I don't. I think that's that's all. When I asked you about it at the time, you said it just smells like dead whale. Yeah. You said there's nothing else that smells like a no, dead whale. No, it's got a, it's got a peculiar order. But if you want to know what it smells like, uh, I kept my watch. <laughs> I had my watch on during when we were doing the whale, and you can all there in the exhibit. You can smell my watch. Oh, you have that on display. I have it on display. <laughs> yep. So everybody can get a sense of what a the dead blue whale smells like. Uh, so the forelimbs are well developed in whales, they're modified of course as flippers, but they're well developed. So you're looking at the same bones that you have but in, your, uh, in your shoulder <laughs> and your arm. Just much larger. Yeah, a bit bigger. Yeah. A bit bigger. And then we got down to the, is there anything specific about the jaw here or this well, part the, of the whale? Well, the skull is immense. Uh, so this, the one thing about whales is the head is a lot bigger than the rest, than proportionally than it is in other mammals. And so the way the head actually takes up about 20% of the length of the whole animal or more, 20 to 25 percent. So the whale, so it weighs several tons. Each jaw weighed a ton apiece. Each lower jaw weighs a ton apiece. And the cranium weighs four, about four tons. We in Newfoundland Labrador have seen a lot of this whale and now members of the public here in Toronto and surrounding areas will get their chance on March 11th. But bear in mind that this is only one of two whales. There has been a second whale, Flens, and that belongs to Memorial University, one that it hopes to display or it will display when the new science building is built there in St. John's. Reporting live from the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, I'm Jeremy Eaton for Here and Now. It's actually quite interesting how strong the outcry against it has been. An expert on human rights law is weighing in tonight on the frustrations some people have about the way courts deal with sexual assault victims.
Two sexual assault court rulings have sparked outrage in St. John's and Halifax, and those rulings have many people talking about the issue of consent as it's seen in the eyes of the law. In St. John's, there was a public uproar after RNC Constable Doug Snellgrove was acquitted by a jury after he claimed he had consensual sex with a young woman he drove home from downtown in a police car. He was on duty at the time, and the woman had been drinking and told the jury she couldn't remember if she consented. Now in Halifax, a similar story is playing out. A taxi driver was charged with sexual assault after an intoxicated woman was found nearly naked and unconscious in the back seat of his vehicle. Now the judge acquitted the driver and made national headlines when he said, quote, clearly a drunk can consent. Now, the Crown is appealing the verdict in both provinces. The fallout from these two cases is in the forefront of a meeting today in Ottawa. The Department of Justice is holding a day-long session to discuss how the justice system responds to sexual assault complaints against adults. Wayne McKay is a professor of law at Dalhousie University. His specialty is human rights, and he joins me now uh, from our Halifax studio. So, Mr. McKay, we know the outrage the court case involving the RNC officer has sparked here in this province, and we even saw a protest at police headquarters. But tell me what the reaction has been like in your city to the taxi driver case and the, the similar court ruling. Well, it's been an extremely strong reaction, a strong negative reaction. And in fact, uh, yesterday there were protests, there's been ser various protests, but yesterday at City Hall, large gatherings of people protesting the verdict. So it's actually quite interesting how strong the outcry against it has been. And in some ways, whether that's right or wrong, I think that's a good thing. Uh, in that it shows people are concerned that the system seems to be failing victims of sexual assault. And both cases hinged on consent in the Halifax case. Why do you think the judge's comment that, uh, quote, clearly a drunk can consent has been such a lightning rod there? Well, I think uh, at, a, at a minimum it was appear to be ill-chosen words. I mean, first of all, there's not very much that's clear about the law of sexual, uh, sexual assault consent. It's one of the more murky areas of the law. And even though at first glance, and they try to define it in the code, there's a great deal of discretion. The second, perhaps more problematic point, what is a drunk? And uh, the real challenge in consent law in these cases is that there's two extremes. A person who's completely unconscious, who the Supreme Court of Canada and others have said cannot consent, but on the other end of the sc scale is a situation where you are completely capable of consenting, but what does intoxication do? Uh, at what point do you become incapable of consenting? So some degree of intoxication doesn't eliminate consent. A strong degree of intoxication to the point that you're not capable of making an informed choice does eliminate consent. Now, one of the other uh, similar points in both of these cases is that they involve people in positions of trust, you know, especially in St. John's where an on-duty police officer was accused. Um, how does that complicate the issue of consent? Well, I think it does complicate the issue of consent. Uh, specifically, I think it's in Section 273 of the Code. They do list some circumstances where there is not consent. And one of them is where a person in a position of trust, authority, or power abuses that position. And certainly, as you say, in the Snellgrove case in, in your province, one could argue that the police officer would quite clearly fit that, at least uh, arguably. So the meeting that's happening in Ottawa, the meeting that's going to look at how the courts uh, deal with sexual assault, what do you think needs to come out of that meeting? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I think, first of all, the fact that they're having the meeting maybe does this part. They need to recognize that the current system does not seem to respond effectively to the needs of complainants and victims of sexual assault. And I think they also need to recognize and acknowledge that there seems to be a significant disconnect between the legal system and its understandings of what's appropriate and the general public. And that's certainly playing out in Halifax and probably played out in your province as well. Beyond that, then I think you have to look at what can be done. And I think there's some things that hopefully they will look at. 
for example, after the Gomeshi trial, they talked about uh, paying for counsel for complainants so that they could have some advice in the process so it's less traumatizing. Lots of discussion, uh, including a bill by uh, current leader of the Conservative Party, Rona Ambrose, that would have judges have mandatory training in this area, including sensitivity training. I think that's another thing, hopefully, that would come out of this. Another suggestion she made was that the decisions of a judge in these cases be required to be written because I think given the complexity, it makes it much easier to analyze this if there's a written as opposed to an oral decision. More on the ex more uh, extensive kind of reforms, I think things like specialized sexual assault courts, which is something that exists in some other countries, including some of the states in the United States, where all the people in that system, the judges, the prosecutors, the lawyers, have a special training and would mostly operate in this quite specialized area. All right, Wayne McKay, thank you so much for joining us today. No problem. Uh, nice to be in your fair province, by, by video at least. The weather update is brought to you by Belltone Hearing Service St. John's, helping the world hear better. Well, some nasty weather on the way for much of the province, so let's check back in with Colette Kennedy, and hopefully it's going to be a little nicer for the weekend. Well, there's certainly something for everyone with this system that's moving in. Rain, snow, ice pellets, freezing rain, some fog. Certainly in the overnight hours, we're going to see some fog development as well. Some windy conditions at times. Yes, and even tomorrow in a portion of the day, some sunshine, believe it or not. So uh, as it overtook the Maritimes and then pushing through the day, moving into southwestern portions of Newfoundland here, starting off as some snow, and that's often the case with this. We'll probably see that, in fact, all the way over towards eastern sections of the island because it's coming in through the overnight hours later this evening into the overnight. Then turning into kind of a mix of precipitation, you get into some of these ice pellets or when it's freezing on contact into some of that freezing rain as some of that colder air is spilling over top of the warmer air at the surface. And then as the temperatures rise, when we get into that more southerly or southeasterly float, we get into uh, more of a rainfall event. So looking at that freezing rain warning, I just want to show it to you one more time because I know some folks, you know, you're working or taking the kids to some practices or that kind of thing into the evening. You're actually out there on the roads. Uh, freezing rain warning stretching all the way from the Avalon all along the coast up towards the northern peninsula. And then we're seeing just as we're going up here along the coast of Labrador, we get into the snowfall warning where 15 to 25 centimeters may not be unusual for snowfall totals here. Happy Valley, Goose Bay, you're going to be seeing 5 to 10 through the overnight and then getting into an additional 5 or so through the day tomorrow. So taking you through this bit by bit, by the time we get into the later evening hours, that's when we see that snow changing over towards some freezing rain or drizzle. I was showing you a different model earlier, and I like this one better because it kind of shows that transition much better here into the snow up across Labrador, some of the heavier stuff pushing towards the coastline. You see that wind direction as we're heading into tomorrow and a clearing trend. And, and that's true. We will get into a clearing trend. We'll see some of the clouds moving out, get rid of some of that fog in the morning hours, and then some sunshine and then later in the day clouds coming back and some flurries to drizzle to flurries in some cases because I was uh, saying the temperature is going to be above freezing it'll actually be some light shower activity and then really watch that wind flow changing directions as we get behind this system and to see more of a westerly to eventually a northwesterly flow that will come through and then that stronger wester fl westerly flow as we head towards uh, later into the day as we get towards Friday so the snowfall accumulations now this is kind of additional so that's why Labrador City, I'm just saying another, say, five to eight for you guys. But all told, you're going to be closer to that 25 centimeters for Happy Valley Goose Bay. And that's why we see that number uh, popping up and the warning in place there. So over the next several days, this is just to show you what's kind of happening earlier in the day with the snow. Then it will start to ease off and we get into more of a flurry activity over the next few days. Some colder air, though, coming in for the beginning of next week for sure. St. John's tomorrow, see the temperature rising through the night up to four. After we get rid of the fog and drizzle in the morning, then we get into some sunshine. But, of course, central Newfoundland, western Newfoundland, you'll see kind of flurries coming back or even some light showers coming back at you. And just a reminder, Saturday night, yes, spring those clocks forward. Now uh, it's a time to look at something which I have never in my life been 
But congratulations to our athlete of the day. Yes, and our athlete of the day is Noah Barnett. He's seven years old and lives in Lab City. Noah plays football, hockey, and soccer, but uh, his favorite sport is baseball. Yeah, he's part of the Labrador West Minor Softball League, and his preferred position is pitcher. You'll have to wait for some of that snow to melt before he can get back out, though, so congratulations. You are our Young Athlete of the Day. At the Briar this week, many fans are wearing costumes, but there's a group called the Sociables that still manages to stand out in that crowd. And if you've watched any of the games in person, you've almost undoubtedly seen them. They are Briar legends, and every different day they have a different costume. Zach Gowdy caught up with them. So we're the Sociables, so we're just kind of a curling fanatic group that kind of follows the Briars around. Uh, we've been to this, what, our seventh Briar? Yep. Seventh Briar. Seventh Briar. Seventh Briar. To go along, we dress in a different costume every single day. Oh. So we've been uh, Where's Waldo, we've uh, been the Blues Brothers, Elvis, Top Gun. Uh, kilts, we usually wear kilts all the time as yeah, well. Yeah, kilts are always... Uh, Jeez, we you know, social media, we have, we have them all up there. There's so many you can't even remember in them all anymore. Briar was in Calgary in 2009, so a couple of guys went and said, hey, let's have a good time. So the year after that was in Halifax. So I said, let's go out. Let's go out to Halifax. And let's, have a, let's have a good time out there. I'm like, how are we going to make it more fun? And they go, let's bring a bunch of costumes and let's bring a bunch of signs. So we ended up bringing sociable signs because, uh, hey, that's a kind of a very Eastern thing to do. So we started doing that, and that's how we slowly got labeled the sociables. So we just kind of kept, kept with it, kept going with it, and kind of that's just who we are now. Do the other Briar regulars now see you guys? Hey, sociable! Definitely, we can. Oh, yeah. we, we walk in any place now. People know you. They, they come to tell us stories about us. We saw you guys last year, year before, year after that, and they're all pulling out their photos on the cameras and stuff and showing us. So it's, it's, it's great to see that those memories and you know then you start realizing who are the regulars themselves. So as you actually get to meet and start talking to the same people year after year. Romance, but I'm frankly feeling 
Well, if you love the music from the Oscar winning film La La Land, you won't want to miss this. The movie is going to be screened around the world with a live orchestra playing the soundtrack. The U.S. tour starts in May with Canadian dates to be announced later. Wow, this is about as Canadian as it gets. Have a look. Go out there, we're on the air. It's hockey night tonight. Tension grows, the whistle blows, and the puck... Y yep, that's the hockey song, the Stompin' Tom Connors made classic. And this is a fresh version by a Canadian YouTuber, Samurai Guitarist. As you can hear, and aside from the hockey stick guitar, all the other instruments are all hockey noises. Yes, the scratching of the skates, the banging of the sticks, all true Canadian sounds. Yeah, well, let's go out on this music. Thanks for watching, everyone. Have a great night tonight.